Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. My name is Johanna, and I'm from the UN Innovation Network. And this webinar today is run in collaboration with the UN University's Institute in Macau, and it's about using technology in the fight against forced labor. To give you a little bit of context, 25 million people worldwide are trapped in situations of forced labor. And to give you a little comparison, that is equivalent to the entire population of Australia. And only a fraction of these people, less than 1%, identified and helped to escape the situations. And in our webinar today, we're going to learn a little bit about why this is the case. We're going to learn about existing techniques for identifying victims of trafficking and their shortcomings. And then we're going to learn about new solutions to support the screening and identification of possible victims of uh, human trafficking. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter of the day. Hannah Siniano is a Principal Research Fellow at the UN Youth Institute in Macau. She holds a PhD in computer science from the University of South Australia and specializes in human computer interactions, mobile computing, migration, and labor exploitation. Hannah is joining us from Macau, where it's already rather late. So thank you, Hannah, for joining us, even though it's after hours for you. And I believe before we dive into the content of the webinar, Hannah is going to share a few words about the UN University in case not everyone is familiar with the work. The UNU system is a global system of research and training institutes which are coordinated um, by UNU Centre in Tokyo. So each of these different um, little dots here is one of the different um, institutes. So I'm not going to talk about all of them because there's a little bit too many um, to mention. If I just pick on a few of them, um, UNU IIGH, the International Institute for Global Health, is based in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Um, they've actually just been awarded a sizable grant from the Melinda Gates Foundation to generate evidence and accelerate action for gender equality in global health policy and programming. Um, another one, so UNU Biolec, is the biotech program for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and they're focused on training and capacity development um, in biotechnology, always ensuring that the biotech applications respect human and animal rights and don't negatively impact in the environment. Another one perhaps um, many of you are more familiar with is UNICPR, um, the Center for Policy Research based in New York. Um, it's a UN focused think tank um, with a mission to generate policy research that informs major UN policy processes in the field of peace and security, humanitarian affairs and global development. Um, if I pick one from the other side of the world, let's think of Africa. So UNU INRA is the only UNU in Africa, so in Ghana. Um, that's the Institute for National Natural Resources in Africa, aiming to assist in the efficient and sustainable management of, the Afri of Africa's natural resources. Um, and then a taste from one of the many in um, Europe, if I pick on UNI Chris um, in Belgium. They're the Comparative Regional Integration Studies. So they focus on regional integration and work in partnership with institutes and initiatives throughout the world um, that are concerned with issues of integration, governance and cooperation. So us, I'll turn to me right now. We're from UNU Macau, the Institute in Macau, and we have a focus on the key challenges faced by developing societies through high impact in innovations in computing and um, information technologies. So most of um, my presentation today is going to be about one of these technologies that we've been working on for um, four years, and um, it's called the Prize. So a Prize looks at using technology to face against labor exploitation and forced labor. So let me define some terms before I get to that. Our research is, um, generously funded by the Humanity United and the Freedom Fund. In particular, this research um, pilot study that we did with the Thai government. So let me get to um, the definition of terms that I mentioned. So here on the screen, you'll see um, Skrvanikova's continuum of exploitation. And we use this continuum to understand labor and labor exploitation. So we understand labor exploitation is a continuum ranging from labor compliance at one end through various labor and criminal law violations to extreme exploitation or forced labor at the other end. So um, with this in mind, we can see that work situations that may begin as consensual and mutually beneficial can transform over time to oppressive and exploitative environments. 
Um, so if you look at this little um, arrow on my screen here, that's trying to indicate the relationship with human trafficking. So um, this arrow is showing that human trafficking is a process um, consisting of a series of exploitative acts that move the worker towards a situation of forced labour. So with these definitions in mind, when you say that we're looking at technology to fight against labour exploitation, I'm referring to this broad cross-section um, on this continuum of minor kinds of exploitative acts all the way up to forced labour. So we started this research um, end of 2016 um, when I was looking at the figures. Um, so these figures are um, released, or the current estimates released um, by ILO in 2017, say that um, there are 24.9 million people in situations of forced labour. So I've got these little deeds on my screen here, and each one of them is representing 100,000 people. If we look at the, um, at the reports each year, each, um, we see that we identify less than 100,000 victims of trafficking and forced labor each year. So this tells me that there's something wrong with our current um, techniques for identifying victims of trafficking. If all we're able to do with our current methods of identifying people is to help one of these little guys, um, then there's a whole heap of people that we're missing out there. What this also tells me is that um, what we know about practices of exploitation stems from a very small fraction of cases that exist. So to get a better understanding of the problems um, in the field, we started in early 2017 um, by visiting a broad cross-section of stakeholders um, in Thailand, all with mandates in um, forced labour and victim identification. So this um, includes um, the police, we work with the police, the Department of Special Investigations, which is a Ministry of Justice, and the NGOs and different intergovernmental organisations with mandates in, um, in labour exploitation um, and migration. And um, so we also went to NGOs and shelters to understand from all these different um, stakeholders um, what were they currently doing to identify victims of trafficking and how did they think technology could play a role to support them in identifying more people. So if, if we start one of these steps back, the first step was to understanding how do they currently identify victims. Um, so Overwhelmingly, people talked about three steps. So the first step was really outreach campaigns or initial screening and um, to say, well, here are people in a, a vulnerable sector of work and do they need help? Do they want help? Um, if people wanted help, um, then um, they would kind of move to phase two of their process, which is to do further investigation. And from there, if um, the investigations provide evidence of exploitation and severe exploitation, then we go to step three, which is with the courts. With the, each of these three steps, we decided to really focus on the first step, which is the initial screening. Um, case management tools already exist out there and they um, already do a great job at capturing different evidence. Um, and, and the court part of this whole process, really, we didn't feel like we could make a significant contribution there. So if we narrow down on that initial screening phase of victim identification, um, again, we talked to a broad cross-section of stakeholders. I call this um, cross-section frontline responders, which is anyone with a mandate to assess labour conditions. Um, so this includes, as I said, police officers, um, labour inspectors, the so government labour inspectors, as well as private auditors and NGOs and intergovernmental organisations. So um, based on this broad cross-section of both frontline respondents and victims um, of exploitation, um, we found four different problems that um, came up in each of the different groups that we talked to. So the first problem people discussed was um, problems with communication. So 
if different languages are spoken by different groups of either internal or transnational migrant populations. Um, and it's impossible to have enough translators of the right language with you um, in case you come across different demographics. Um, privacy issues, initial screening often happens in the field and in front of anybody and potentially the exploited. This meant that um, migrant workers and, um, were worried to, to speak freely about their, um, the conditions of work that they were facing. Um, people talked about problems with trading because practices of exploitation change over time and in response to changing laws and inspection practices. So it becomes a game of cat and mouse. So unless there's um, continual training on the current practices of exploitation, the frontline responders are often left looking for previous signs of exploitation. So in a number of cases, we talk to people who would say, you know, um, the frontline responders that we come across, they just look for signs of, of um, bruises. And if there's no bruising, they say, well, the person can't be held against their will, therefore it's not a case of this labor. Um, the final um, point, which I call trust, um, really it talks about a lack of trust between all the parties involved, specifically in sectors where exploitation is right. So um, from the worker's perspective, they don't necessarily trust the intentions of the frontline responders. Um, from the frontline responders' perspective, they don't necessarily trust that the workers are going to be telling the truth. And then there's this third person right in the middle there, the translators, when you're lucky enough to have one, and neither of the other parties necessarily trust the, um, the translators and the accuracy of the translations that they provide. Um, so based on this and kind of cutting a very long story short, we developed a system called Apprise. So Apprise is a mobile app um, which is downloaded onto the frontline responders phone but ultimately is a tool in the potential victim's hand. Why did we um, target a frontline responder's phone? Well, from our initial stakeholder consultations, we were told that they were the ones who always had the access to technology. If I was exploiting you, often I would take away um, your ability to call for help. Um, so how does a prize work? So a prize aims to overcome the training and communication divide by providing a list of questions that represent the current indicators of exploitation. These um, lists of questions are sector specific. Um, and then when used regularly, this enables frontline responders to proactively and consistently collect data of the current reported practices of exploitation. If we think back to that list of questions that I talked about, each of these questions is aligned to key indications of labor exploitation. Um, and this allows the frontline responders to undertake post hoc analysis to identify changing trends. If I look at this, um, this screen that you see here, you can see six little um, mobile phone screens. So the first one really shows the interface that the frontline responders presented with when they first log on and accept the terms and conditions um, of a prize. So in this you can see I have five different lists of questions and so each is aligned to a different sector because people are abused and exploited differently in each sector of work. Um, if I select a sector, then um, what happens is I have a list of the, the translations that are available. So at this point, if I was the frontline responder, I would have my headphones plugged into my phone and I would give the phone to a potential um, victim. They would put on the headphones and they would select from the list of, of languages available um, to find their own language. So when they click on one of the different flags, what happens is the name of the language um, plays in that language. Um, so if I clicked on the English flag, it would say English, press the green button to continue. Um, if I select the green button, then what would happen is I would get um, to this screen here, which is the introduction video. So the introduction video is the um, to introduce the purpose of, um, of the interview and to provide some information. So it, in the screen, it's indicating how to use the interface. It also says what the purpose of collecting the information is for 
and ask for consent to continue. If consent is provided, um, then the app cycles through the list of questions, which are audio and questions read in the language that the um, potential victim has chosen. So you can see in the interface, we have these different buttons. So each of the um, questions is a yes, no weighted question. Um, so things like, are you older than 18 years old? Or are you, do you have access to your ID documents? Um, if I say no to that question, well then maybe the next question would say, can you access your ID if you need it? So the lists are um, cycled through. Um, and then at the end, the last question says, Thank you for your responses. Based on your responses, it seems like you're in a vulnerable situation, or in this case, a highly vulnerable situation, if we look at this, um, this screen here. Um, and it says, um, but you said that you wanted to stay. Um, are you sure you want to stay in this situation? So it gives the, um, the potential victim a chance to reconsider their response. Um, and then what happens is they're told to give the phone back to the frontline responder. Now the frontline responder gets one of these two screens displayed for them. So this one um, we have been using with um, some sectors of work, so with NGOs, for example. Um, and this one was a interface that we made specifically for the Thai government, which um, provides advice of what the next steps could be. Um, based on the responses to the questions. You'll see down the bottom of the screens, either one of them has a, a little icon which indicates if the person said they wanted to leave, and another key indicator was um, if they're um, under 18. So if the um, frontline responder clicks on the green continue button, everything is stored onto the phone, and then it's uploaded to the um, the frontline responders accounts when they next log in with internet access. So the whole system, as you can see, is designed for illiterate users. Um, we have the interface shown on these, um, these um, images here in English, because I speak English, but um, the whole thing gets translated into the language of the frontline responder. So in our instance in Thailand, all of this text that is in English, and including these ones here, is translated into Thai. So say I am now the frontline responder and I return to my office and I've uploaded the account. Each one of the responses is highlighted on a map. Now let me first say that this information on this um, screen is all fake. It's, um, there's no real content, no real interview responses being shown here. Um, I just wanted to show you with this that um, we have a map-based visualization which um, has drop points for each of the different interviews and the color of the flag to show the severity of the, um, the interview. So for example, on the previous slide, we said highly vulnerable situation. That would have been a red um, pin. If there were no indications of exploitation, it would have been a green pin. So this slide shows the, um, a summary of the key findings of each interview. Um, if you click on one of them, um, at the top what happens is we summarize both the request for help as well as the indicators that were identified um, in the interview. And then you can drill down by clicking on this button here, but I've already clicked on it in the screen capture, um, to show the different questions um, the alignment with the ILA forced labor indicators and, and then the response for danger as well as on the far right hand side, the response that the, um, the potential victim gave. So this, is, this allows the frontline responder to go back over and understand the, um, the res results of each of the interviews that they undertook. We added this extra feature um, for post hoc analysis of responses. Um, so this um, now provides you a way at the top of the page here to filter the different um, uh, interviews and you can filter them based on different functions. So for example, here we have the question list, the language that the um, interview was undertaken in, the gender of the respondent, that only works if there's a question about gender um, that was asked to the participant, as well as the indicators that were identified as vulnerabilities in the responses. 
and from there it will allow you to see how what were the top questions basically that um, were answered as vulnerabilities in that sample that you just filtered in this top tracer. I hope that makes sense. If not, I'll take questions about it at the end. So APRISE has been used in a number of different sectors of work. Um, in other studies, we are using APRISE um, in um, garment manufacturing along with multinational corporations. In this case, the frontline responders we're working with are private auditors within supply chains. Um, on the far right hand side here, this is our work with NGOs, both in the fishing as well as um, sex work sectors. Um, just to give you an idea that we have been using the same um, technology in different sectors, but what we're focusing on in this um, presentation is um, our pilot study with the Thai government. Um, so, as I wasn't sure of your background, um, what I thought I would do was start by giving you a bit of background of um, the situation in Thailand. So, in 2015, the EU raised a yellow card against Thailand in response to the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, so IUU fishing. Um, in response, Thailand has been engaged in fundamental reforms of their fisheries and seafood sectors. So, this includes building a robust new legal and policy framework overhauling their fisheries management system and developing a monitoring, control and surveillance system. Quite a lot of this was undertaken in collaboration with the ILA, the Ship to Shore Rights Project. So the Command Centre for Combating Illegal Fishing, the CIF, was established in 2015 due to the IUU um, issues. And once reforms were completed, it was then handed back over to, um, in 2019 to TIMEC, the Thai Maritime Enforcement Coordinating Centre. I realise I have a lot of um, different acronyms here. So all of this is trying to situate um, that as part of the monitoring, control and surveillance, um, there were port in, port out inspection centres, so say PIPA centres, that were established to improve inspection of fishing vessels before um, the vessels go out and, and on return, um, before they can offload their catch. So um, the Thai government, um, um, we worked with the Royal Thai Navy, Ministry of Labor, Department of Labor Protection and Welfare, DLPW. Um, in this pilot study, we work with these guys in the Command Center for Combating Legal Fishing, um, and they selected four pilot centers for us, um, staffed by multidisciplinary teams to participate in a baseline study, training, rollout, and use of a prize for three months, as well as an inline study. They selected these um, four different um, PIFO centres, Samat Sukhun, Chambari, Rayong and Ch Chantabari. Um, each of these centres was placed to Bangkok, allowing the officials from the head office to easily visit sites and observe the use of reprise and the inspections. So the aim of this pilot study was to um, understand how reprise supported fishers and PIFO multidisciplinary teams to communicate during worker interviews at ports. Um, so with the pilot study, we had an independent evaluator who undertook the baseline and endline assessment for us. To understand the current initial challenges with these screening and the perceptions of technology, we then undertook training and ongoing support for the period of the pilot, um, and then we have an endline assessment. Now, I have to say at this point that we only worked in four um, pilot centres. Some of them had more um, they went to, but it's only four five centers, so the um, results do not reflect the whole system as Thailand. But this was just trying to help us to understand if um, the tool itself was helpful in these PIPO inspections. So um, and in the baseline assistant assessment, our An external evaluator. Multidisciplinary teams, in particular, with an interpreter. They select people. Um, so often, um, the labor inspectors and in interview everyone in a group, and, and they identify as. Um, and when the, the people are supposed to 
could be sometimes used ad hoc translated. So someone at the like inspectors have this interview and um, most of them use parts of the paper-based interview form um, to their interview with the group of, of different workers. Um, what they did I didn't have to respond. Answer question. Um, we also wanted this interview, paper based interview form. It's signed by all members of the group who were interviewed and then stored up at the Piper Center and that's, it's um, requested to be sent for further investigation. There's a high level information that's uploaded on a system called DLPW Smart, but that's kind of just counting numbers of people who were, ident who were interviewed and then high level indicators if anything um, was found. So um, we had training with the um, different PIPO centers on how to use a prize as well as how to integrate it into the existing procedure. I uh, see the time as always, I talk for too long. Um, so I'm gonna skip quickly into our findings. Um, so this was a quote that we received in some of our follow up. Um, I, I talked about we had the three months where we went and um, helped the different um, PIPO centers answered questions and observed how they used the, the tool. And um, so in one of these, um, one of the fishers of the Ryan court was saying that, um, I don't like telling my story repeatedly to others. I know that it's important to talk to them, but it's better to talk about things I wish to forget. Sometimes the face-to-face -face conversation is much harder than I expected. My privacy is protected when the interview is done without others knowing my answer. Um, Interviewers also talked about privacy and they said that um, the, um, they noted that they received many more responses to sensitive questions when using a prize. Um, normally when they ask in face-to-face -face interviews, people wouldn't answer, but they felt that they could answer um, when asked on, on the device. With language barriers, um, this is a quote from a fisher in Chongburi. Um, he says, I prefer to use the application because I can listen Cambodian language by my own. No need an interpreter to translate from Thai to Cambodian. I think it's convenient and feel privacy. Other people do not know what I answered. Um, the translators also, which was interesting, um, noted that employers often refute claims of vulnerable situations by blaming interpreters for poor translations of questions. The interpreters themselves noted that by providing a list of pre-verified translations, this reduces the pressure on the interpreter themselves. Um, some of the um, inspectors talked about doing post-hoc analysis um, on, the, on the findings from the interviews. Um, so I think it was two in particular were saying that after following up on vulnerabilities identified by a prize, these two labor inspectors realized really how little fishers knew about the employment, welfare and protection rights. Um, they said that by when indicators of uh, vulnerability were raised um, using a prize, they would follow up on them and then realize that the, um, the fisher just didn't understand the question. That's what they said. Um, and they said that they used this to uncover um, areas where the fishers themselves require further support and further information about their rights. So ultimately, our aim is um, that data collected through a prize could support evidence-based policy and action, um, firstly through protection, so through proactive screening, and that's really where our key focus is. If we have this proactive screening, we have this evidence base of indications of, of patterns of exploitation, we could use that to inform prevention activities such as education and awareness raising. Um, long, long term, we think that this kind of information could um, be used to contribute to evidence based of current practices, which in turn could inform evidence based policy. Um, and with a, a system like this, um, with partnerships, we can build national reg regional partnerships between stakeholders because we understand that um, forced labour is a, a crime that goes across boundaries. 
if I quickly try and summarize um, what lessons I learned from our work was that tech can support proactive and consistent initial screening of workers for signs of forced labor. It, we have so much evidence that it helps with privacy, language barriers and training. A critical factor is the quality of the questions and the translations. Um, and so that's something that really needs to you find over a process to make sure that the right kind of phrasing, the right kind of colloquial language is used in each of the languages. We also learned that we can analyze responses to understand how patterns change over time. Trust is much more complicated though. With trust, tech in and of itself cannot overcome trust issues, but what it can do is it can support the collection and analysis of patterns of exploitation, and it can provide a channel for improved transparency and accountability. Um, please make sure if there's one takeaway from this, um, take away that I say that um, tech in and of itself isn't going to overcome all these things. It needs to be supported by comprehensive referral mechanisms and an enabling environment with transparency and accountability safeguards. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I think we have a bit of a poll right now. We do indeed. Thank you so much, Hannah. And apologies if there were any audio issues on my side earlier. I hope you can hear me better now. Um, indeed, we thought we'd launch a quick poll. Um, this is a university presentation after all, somewhat a different nature, but still university. So we wanted to uh, quickly test to see uh, what you took away from this. And I'm launching a poll now. We're asking you, we identified four key issues with the initial screening. Which of the following was the most difficult to address? I'll give you a couple of seconds there. Okay, five more seconds. Take a pick. I'm going to assume that everyone who didn't vote isn't isn't quite clear on the answer. And I'm calling now. And here you can see the results, Hannah. Great. So of this, it says 64% of people um, picked trust, which is is the correct answer. And um, one thing from from trust, if I can just follow up with something. A big thing is that if I disclose personal information to you and you don't act on it, well, I'm not going to disclose it again next time. That's the, the part with the referral mechanisms. Great. So that was poll number one. I think we had a second one as well. We're launching that now. Do you face any... Oh, yeah. Uh, select the barriers that are most difficult for you to address. And here you can choose multiple selections. Three, two, one, closing the poll. And here are your results, Anna. Okay, so 62% people chose communication barriers, which was um, closely followed by trust with 59%. It's great to see um, that some of the same, um, the same problems that we identified in the field, maybe it's not great, it's, it's good for me to see that we're not there are new people who um, came across these same problems. Indeed, thanks so much for that. So now that we've checked on our learning and verified it, uh, Hannah, we have a few questions for you and I am going to try and give colleagues the floor. Um, I don't know the name of the first colleagues. F. Sassetti at Mindaroo, you have a good question that I would like to invite you to ask yourself um if you would like to unmute yourself hello Hi. thank you so much for the presentation i cannot change my zoom name uh no worries <laughs> i'm francisca and i've actually um had the chance to collaborate on this project with hannah i my question was about um what are the unintended consequences or implications for workers using a prize as we know um they are in a very vulnerable situation and if they are truthfully reporting something that you know that is abusive or um, 
exploitative you know can that what what can you know what can happen to workers if the other person does not have good intentions if there is a, a law enforcement officer that is bribed or there's you know not using the information to really help um, workers in vulnerable situations so this wasn't planned francisco and i happened to have written a paper <laughs> about um there's this guy called Toyama who talks about um, technology simply being an amplifier of human capacity and intent. So if I am a person with good intent, positive intent, I will use technology to um, carry out my positive intent. In this example, if I was a police officer with positive intent who really wanted to help people in vulnerable situations, I would use any tool, including technology, um, to, to do this. If I was somebody who had negative intent um, and my aim was to exploit people further, well then I would also use technology to undertake this negative intent. So I would use technology in any way possible um, to exploit people. If I think of this, um, say we have an NGO person and they actually um, work with an exploiter, they could um, use a prize to interview people, get the results and share them with their boss. In the same way as if I was an NGO person and I interviewed people with a paper-based form, I could share that form with their boss as well. So, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything else you had in mind. <laughs> Francisca, was there anything else you had in mind? Uh, no, I thought I said it was a great answer. I was just, um, I was just thinking also in this kind of COVID time as well. Um, okay. Things, I mean, we not just because of COVID, but I see things with also the information that is stored from uh, workers and um, you know issues with privacy as well. Um, just thinking a bit more like with COVID now, the importance of of that, or how how does that change now? potentially. Yeah, I guess it's such a generic thing. Uh, exploitation changes under different um, situations. And say, if we think of factories, maybe with factories, um, maybe there's less jobs. So people are being paid less, maybe they're being in bonds. It's, it's quite a broad, a broad question. And maybe we should take it offline in case there are other questions. Sure, happy to take that offline if it's too complex for now. Um, I think it's just a, a long answer. <laughs> okay, well, absolutely no problem. Uh, if anyone was interested in the long answer, let us know and we'll make sure that it gets to you as well. Um, I had a, a quick like tech question that I want to throw in you before we get to more substantive one. And here a colleague is saying, first of all, great presentation. Uh, always happy to pass on compliments. And uh, the colleague is wondering, does the app have geolocation activated? So do you know where the data is being collected? Yes, so um, if, when you install the app on your phone, just like any um, Google Play Store or um, iPhone app, you have to say if you give permission to use your, um, your location. So if your GPS is on, when you log onto the phone, um, and you gave permission when you installed, then you will be able to locate the, um, it will store your location. Yeah. Um, we have something with privacy in, in this. So if I am a frontline responder, um, the way a prize works is we kind of, we grant access to organizations. So if right now you went to your prize, to the Play Store and um, downloaded and installed a prize and tried to log on, it wouldn't work um, because I would have to make an account for an organization. The organization would be granted access to a question list. Um, and then um, the organization itself would, would give you an account. Um, and so then within your, your organization, you guys um, can undertake interviews. And based on your organization's sharing permissions, um, maybe you share within teams, maybe you keep all of your interviews separate. Um, where location comes in, even within teams, um, if you are the person who undertook the interview, I don't share the direct um, 
location with other people in your team. We we blur it a bit, so we kind of drop um, precision points in your latitude and longitude, um, just for privacy considerations. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Glad privacy was taken into account. Um, I have a question for you from Ferdinand from FAO, and I believe he's based in the Philippines. Ferdinand, I'm unmuting you, and if you would like to ask the question yourself, please go ahead. Otherwise, I'm happy to ask it for you. Okay. Uh, Ferdinand, I'll pass the question on for you. So he's saying most Asian countries... Uh, ASEAN countries rely uh, on foreign earnings from forced labor uh, in the Middle East and Western countries. And in the Phillies is saying it's very depressing reports from domestic workers um, who have little help in, uh, in ex escaping situations of abuse and exploitation. And he's wondering, is it part of your research to uh, appraise and locate for assistance to these people? So what is the next step once, you've have, once you have identified the victims? Uh, how do you match them with potential support? Um, okay, so maybe that part wasn't quite clear when I started. So in, um, there are quite a lot of apps out there which are like helplines and hotlines and things like that. So it's a um, an exploited person who's looking for help um, and they have to put an app on their phone or go to Facebook or however they, they need to ask for help. In our initial interviews with different NGOs um, in Thailand, they talked about the heartache of being on a call on a hotline with someone and both them and the worker knowing that the worker was in a vulnerable situation but not being able to find them. So instead of trying to um, like spread outreach far by providing um, uh, help to frontline responders to access people who are not in front of them. We focus only on supporting frontline responders to communicate with someone who is right there in front of them. The idea with this is that they can then um, figure out if that person wants help, if they need help, um, and then because the person is right there and each of the frontline responders already have existing um, standard operating procedures for what to do when you have a vulnerable person. Um, they then, because they're in front of the person, they take them themselves to the shelter or whatever. We didn't want to get to the point where um, you had to locate someone after finding out they really, really needed help. We have a, a bit of a different take and a bit of a different solution um, than some of the other um, tools out there. Thank you, Hannah. And um, maybe before I hand over to Monica from the ILO, uh, a quick follow-up question from my side. Uh, I was actually wondering if people would be allowed to talk the, to the frontline assistant. So if I was, uh, let's call it the manager or the, you know, someone who employs someone in forced labor situations, I wouldn't let them talk to any respondents. So how do you get around that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we work with different groups of people. Um, we work with, say, private auditors. Um, within supply chains who are there and their job is to talk to um, the workers. And so in some cases we work with labor inspectors, they have a mandate to be there and assess their working conditions. NGOs do outreach, but they don't go into the place of work often. Often they'll wait outside and they'll, or they'll go to the local noodle bar that everyone goes or they're known in the communities. And in their regular outreach, they come across these people and that that kind of builds that trust that I was talking about. So this trusted person from your community now has a tool to be able to speak the same language as you. And it allows, um, say, the NGO to do outreach um, and triage cases and then refer vulnerable cases to their case management team. Um, does that make sense? It does. Thank you, Hannah, for clarifying. Cool. And I'm now would like to invite uh, Monica from the ILO in Geneva to ask her Hi. question. Hi, Monica. Hey, thank you so much for the presentation, Hannah and Johanna, also for your presentation. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, I mean, at the beginning you were showing how many cases are really reported um, and it's very little compared to the total cases. So how much, what was the difference um, in cases identified through the app versus the mechanisms that they were using before in the example that you showed from Thailand? Yeah, it's a good question. 
And my answer is we didn't calculate it. Um, to be able to look at impact, you need to have a significantly long pilot study. We ended up through various external factors, which I'm not going to go into. Um, we ended up having a pilot study for three months and it wasn't enough time to really um, look at impact. I would love some time to do like a one year study across all of the pipo centers or something like that. Um, and then I think I'd be at a, a space where I could answer this question. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Monica. And Hannah, is that planned, a longer study? Um, it wins um, conversation, so we'll, we'll find out. Great, so we're keeping fingers crossed here for you. Um, yeah. I have a question from uh, a colleague and he's saying, uh, thank you first of all again for the amazing research and the specific stories that you shared from Thailand. And the colleague is wondering, has the Apprise app been used in other contexts and how have the technology and its variants served to identify situations of forced labor in other contexts? So it seems like the colleague here knows already a little bit more about Apprise. So he mentions Apprise audit. So mm -hmm. can you maybe share about the different components that we might not be fully aware of yet and how it's been used in other contexts? Yeah, so we have um, Apprise is the, the main um, application that we developed. Um, maybe in 2018, um, we were approached by a number of multinational corporations. Um, we work in um, partnership with an NGO called the Mekong Fund out of Hong Kong, and they are a, um, an NGO who fights slavery from within um, the business supply chain. So they, they help businesses to make changes themselves. Um, so through that partnership, we, um, we developed a prize audit. The difference between a prize and a prize audit is that an auditor goes in to assess a factory rather than an individual. So there's a bit of a different grouping involved. And um, then and there's a summarization of, of responses um, within a factory. So instead of looking at one individual case, looking at 10 cases, for example. Um, so that's the difference between a prize and a prize audit. But a prize itself, we've been using it in fishing and seafood um, processing, and we've been using it in um, sex work. Um, so in the sex work, um, when we have been, instead of partnering with law enforcement, we um, started working with NGOs to support them in their own outreach activities. I kind of see it more as a tool to help them map the exploitation faced by their own community so that they can provide alternate access to justice um, and support their own community um, themselves rather than outside people. Um, so we also have been talking with the, let me get the name right, the Civil Society Anti-Trafficking Task Force in Hong Kong, um, where they're looking at domestic work and um, exploitation and domestic work in Hong Kong. Domestic work is hard because the place of work is um, in somebody's home. And so you don't get labor inspectors in the same way as you do in fishing. Um, and so this is looking at helping NGOs to do outreach as well. So we have a list of questions that we've worked on um, with the different civil society actors in Hong Kong. We've had them translated and we're in the process of verifying those translations. Um, so that we can roll out um, probably next year to help NGOs in their outreach to domestic workers. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing. And I think uh, there will be a lot of interesting synergies between the work that you're doing there and the work that some colleagues from the ILO are doing also on domestic workers, uh, specifically in Hong Kong, I believe. And uh, I think their work focuses on trying to encourage employers to register um, their domestic workers to help them access benefits. So maybe we've identified an opportunity for at least a conversation to align. So uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, I, here's a, a colleague is wondering how the working, con so how with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the ways to check working conditions have changed. How can a prize be used during this current COVID time? Great question. So uh, we actually, for a prize audit, um, the, um, the one with the private auditors and supply chains, 
and um, we have developed firstly a new question list which is shorter and has questions about COVID-19 conditions so things about social distancing being forced to stay in dormitories um, even in your off time and um, things like that so we have one question list that is still used by um, labor inspectors or private auditors, sorry, wrong word, private auditors um, in supply chains in countries where people are still able to go to. Um, in other countries where people, where the auditors are, are not able to travel, um, we have been testing with something we call a prize audit remote. Um, so in this case, a factory has sent a QR code um, and the I told how to put it up basically somewhere where a um, worker has access to their phone and has access to the QR code and is not being surveilled. Um, and the worker can scan the QR code and it will take them to a, a web based version basically of um, a prize. And then with their own phone, with their own he um, headphones, they're able to answer questions. Um, and so in this case, we don't have that. It seems like you're in a vulnerable situation at the end, um, but an alert goes to the auditors and they are told to then um, basically go and check it out. So that's Thanks. the two things we're looking at with COVID. Seems like a very good solution. It's currently being used in one of the multinational corporations that partners with us. Great. Thanks for sharing, Hannah. Um, and the, oh, I was just going to say our last question, but then I see another one coming in. Uh, I have Mark Liberati from UNV. Mark, do you want to ask the question yourself? Oh, sorry, I just muted you. We're unmuted. Please unmute again, Mark. Yes, hi. Thank you. I was just curious, um, because trust is such a, a big issue and also the privacy, like what security vulnerabilities have you identified in this app and really also then for the plenary and thinking on how you mitigated those. And also um, as a blockchain enthusiast, I just, but I also think as trust was a central aspect and uh, there's a lot of potential for improving on trust from decentralized technologies, including like blockchain and distributed ledger technology, how, what thought has been uh, into that and using cryptography to address those trust issues that you identified. Thank you. Cool. Um, let me start with security vulnerabilities. Um, the app is designed to not um, capture any personally identifiable information. Um, any information that could be used together with multiple other pieces to try and identify the person is, um, is encrypted. And then we, we do things like we, we drop decimal points and location and things like that to um, protect the privacy of the, um, of the worker themselves. We haven't found any security vulnerabilities yet. <laughs> Hopefully we won't. Um, but we have done some, we've taken some serious precautions with um, the tool because we understand how vulnerable the information is or vulnerable the people are um, who we're collecting information from. Um, have we thought of distributed ledger technology? So as a computer scientist, I am one of those computer scientists who say, let's not be tech centric. Um, there are places where we can use blockchain, but it's not the answer to all of life's problems. Um, a number of people have come up to me and asked if they can use, if they can put my database on a blockchain, on a distributed ledger. And I'm like, you know, I don't see what that gives in this situation. One thing I have been thinking about recently is um, one of my last points I, I mentioned, um, follow-up and transparency and accountability at the end. So if um, there are vulnerabilities identified in an interview, I think there might be a role for some kind of distributed ledger um, with a very small set of people who are allowed to access it because we're talking about vulnerable information to say these parties identified cases of exploitation, did they follow up? Um, and if they followed up, Where's the proof of that follow-up? So that's um, something I've been toying with in my head. I actually, unfortunately, am an anti-blockchain person, <laughs> but we could talk about that for another time. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. And no problem with being anti-blockchain, as long as we find the right solution to a problem, 
uh, I think we've done yeah. well no matter what technology it comes to. And I'm sure Mark would agree with that, uh, even though he's a blockchain uh, enthusiast. <laughs> With that, Hannah, I want to say a big thank you to you for joining us this evening, this morning. Uh, I've learned a lot. I hope colleagues on the call have too. Really insightful presentation and some great work you and the colleagues are doing. So a big thank you for being with us today. Thanks for this opportunity. It's been great chatting. Uh, you should see my email there if anyone wants to follow up further. Your email is there, that's right. Feel, please feel free to get in touch with Hannah and we will also be sharing the presentation and uh, further links to reading and a recording of this webinar in case you'd like to catch up that way. So thank you so much, Hannah. Wishing you a good evening. Greetings to Macau and best of luck. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye.